The following is distributed by the Berean Call. I'm Gary Carmichael, reading Dave Hunt's book, Judgment Day, Islam, Israel, and the Nations, published by the Berean Call, copyright 2005. Chapter 1, The Stage is Set. The conflict between tiny Israel and the vast coalition of Arab Muslim nations arrayed against her is without question the most dangerous situation facing the world today. It is also the major subject of the Bible, in which are recorded in detail 2,000 to 3,000 years before they occurred the events leading to today's Middle East debacle. Furthermore, a fact to which political and religious world leaders surprisingly pay little attention, the Bible not only foretold the tragedy in detail, but declared its outcome. The consequences of this fact are logical and obvious. If the Bible is an error concerning Israel, its major subject, then all of the synagogues and Christian churches that claim to base their beliefs upon those scriptures ought to admit that fact and shut their doors. If, however, the Bible is true, then the nations of the world ought to govern their conduct accordingly. For if they do not, the consequences will be disastrous. The following pages throw out this challenge to the world. Nearly 30% of the Bible is devoted to prophecies. These are not cheap psychic predictions or the vague French quatrains of a Nostradamus that seemingly can be made to fit every new event that arises. Biblical prophecies are direct, straightforward, and fully verifiable declarations foretelling major events in world history, centuries and even thousands of years in advance. There are no such prophecies in the Quran, in the Hindu Vedas, in the sayings of Buddha or Confucius, nothing that even comes close in any writings, religious or secular. It is to the fulfillment of these prophecies, witnessed by the world, that the God of the Bible points as proof that He alone is the true God. Quote, I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Before it came to pass, I showed it thee. New things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. End quote. The Bible's many prophecies identify beyond question the one true God and the Bible as His unique revelation to mankind. Who is this God who inspired the Bible through some 40 different prophets over a period of over 1,600 years? The Bible says His name is I Am, that is Yahweh, meaning that He is self-existent, without beginning or end. Nine times He is called God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. From these patriarchs, the Jews have descended. Yahweh, to whom we just referred, is called the God of Israel 203 times, and it is to Israel that He gave the promised land. Never is He called the God of Ishmael, from whom the Arabs claim descent, and never is He called the God of the Arabs. Of course, never is He called the God of the Americans, or of the French, the Russians, or anyone else and that this God is not Allah of the Muslims is made absolutely clear. Those who may be offended by these facts need to take their complaint to the God of the Bible, not to this writer. My purpose is only to point out precisely what the Bible says, truth that most ignore and many refuse to accept, but which we will prove in the following pages from history and current developments in the Middle East. It rankles many people that the Bible repeatedly declares that the Jews are God's chosen people. That was His choice, whether the rest of us like it or not. So at the very outset of our study, the identity of the God of the Bible must be made clear. Some of the prophecies to which we will turn are specifically for our day. They set the stage for severe judgment from God, for which planet Earth is rapidly ripening. This will become clear as we proceed. Indisputably, Israel is the major topic of biblical prophecy, just as it is of the daily news. 
The word Israel is found 2,565 times in 2,293 verses in the King James translation of the Bible, while Jerusalem is found 811 times in 764 verses. In contrast, the word Jerusalem is not found even once in the Koran. Yet Muslims insist that Jerusalem is their third holiest city. That this is a false claim we will document beyond dispute, as well as the fact that those who call themselves Palestinians and who make the claim that Israel is occupying their land are imposters. See chapter 4. Prophecies concerning Israel and Jerusalem are precise and beyond misinterpretation. We will confine ourselves to several that are clearly being fulfilled in our times. Some of them specifically warn of God's judgment upon those who attempt to bring a peace to the Middle East that defies what God has decreed for His people, Israel. The methods that the West has adopted in recent decades are denounced in Scripture, including the current Roadmap to Peace. Remarkably, the prophecies upon which we will focus in the following pages could apply only to the present day. Unrecognized by world leaders who ignore the warnings in the Bible, God is at work behind the scenes, bringing about events that He has foretold in His Word. In the following pages, we will present specific fulfilled prophecies for our day, examples of what God says He is presently doing on this earth and the punishment He is about to pour out upon all the nations for their mistreatment of His people, the Jews, and the nation of Israel. Hundreds of prophecies fulfilled in the past are the guarantee that biblical warnings that apply to our generation are not empty threats. A cup of trembling, a burdensome stone. 2,500 years ago, the God of the Bible, through his prophet Zechariah, declared, quote, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. End quote. This is an amazing declaration. Not only that Jerusalem, which was then in complete ruins, would be the focus of worldwide attention one day, but also that all of Israel's neighbors would be united against her. Throughout its history, Israel has had many enemies, Egyptians, Philistines, Syrians, Assyrians, Babylonians, and so forth. Never, however, did all the people round about, that is, her neighbors, join together in common cause to destroy her. This is true today, exactly as the Bible foretold for the first time in Israel's history. Moreover, it marks the beginning of the end of anti-Semitism, as we shall see. God goes on to say, And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. The language is very precise. A burdensome stone for all people but a cup of trembling for Israel's neighbors around her. What is the difference? For more than 50 years, Israel's neighbors have attacked her repeatedly, and she has proved too strong militarily for them, even though they outnumber her 50 to 1 and have tried to catch her by surprise. Soundly defeated every time, her neighbors tremble and feign a desire for peace, with the aim, of course, to ultimately deceive and annihilate her, a strategy established for Muslims by Muhammad himself, the founder and prophet of Islam. The God of the Bible has promised to protect Israel, while Allah of the Quran and Islam has sworn to put an end to her. The real battle is not between Arabs and Jews, but between Allah and Yahweh. There is no question of the outcome, but it will be costly for both sides. Israel will be severely disciplined, and her enemies will be destroyed. Precisely as foretold, Jerusalem is a burdensome stone to all people of the world. How much of a burden is she? The United Nations has spent one-third of its time either deliberating and arguing about or denouncing Israel because of its hold on Jerusalem a tiny nation that has one one-thousandth of the world's population, has occupied one-third of the United Nations' time. 
More than 60,000 individual votes have been cast in the U.N. against Israel. That is a burden indeed, exactly as the Bible foretold. Is this merely a coincidence? We will pile prophecy upon prophecy being fulfilled in our day until coincidence is revealed as utter foolishness. Skeptics have accused evangelicals of trying to fit prophecy to current events, claiming that no one recognized such prophecies in the past, but only since Israel was formed in 1948. On the contrary, for centuries before it happened, most evangelical Christians believed and preached from the Bible the return of the Jews to their own land. Even leading Calvinist John Owen, basing his opinion upon Bible prophecy, wrote in the 17th century, quote, The Jews shall be gathered from all parts of the earth and brought home into their homeland. End quote. Martin Luther recognized some of the prophecies concerning Israel, and because they had not been fulfilled in his day, he wrote off the Jews as God's chosen people. Quote, if the Jews are Abraham's descendants, then we should expect to see them back in their own land, with a state of their own. But what do we see? We see them living scattered and despised. End of quote. That the Jews were scattered and despised was itself, as we shall see, a fulfillment of Bible prophecies that Luther didn't recognize. The prophecies concerning Israel's regathering were not for Luther's day, but for ours. The very fact that the Jews are back in their own land after 2,500 years of being scattered worldwide, and that they speak their original Hebrew, just as King David did 3,000 years ago, is a remarkable fulfillment of another Bible prophecy for the last days. No other people have returned to establish their own nation once again, having retained their original language and after being out of their land for such a period of time. There would seem to be more than enough reasons for this tiny and only recently rebirthed nation to tremble before the enemies surrounding her, and before the combinations of the U.N. and European Union. Surely such a small country could be easily pushed around. Of course, if that were the case, she would be a burden to no one. But Israel cannot be pushed around by her neighbors nor by anyone else. The Israeli defense forces are among the best in the world, exactly as the Bible foretold of fire devouring surrounding nations. And that fulfills another prophecy. Quote, In that day I will make the governors of Judah like an hearth of fire among the wood, and they shall devour all the people round about. End of quote. This is exactly what has happened, to the surprise and chagrin of the world. Notice the repetition in many last days prophecies of the phrase, I will. God is doing something on this earth in preparation for judging the nations. Those who refuse to see God's hand at work will reap the consequences for their unbelief in the face of overwhelming evidence. In October of 1973, in what became known as the Yom Kippur War, the attacking Arab forces from Egypt 80,000 Egyptians overwhelmed and slaughtered 500 Israeli defenders along the Suez. And Syria, 1,400 tanks swept down the Golan with only one Israeli tank in service to oppose them, caught Israel completely by surprise. The Soviets knew exactly when the attack was coming, October 6, 1973, and removed the last of the dependents of their staffs on October 5th. America's National Security Administration, or NSA, knew that an Arab Pearl Harbor was about to be launched against Israel. Dozens of notices were sent by the NSA to the Nixon White House, which had positive evidence at least two days in advance of the attack. Nixon, however, for his own reasons, chose not to notify Israel probably imagining that this horrible betrayal of our only real ally in the Middle East would not be discovered. The White House finally gave Israel reprehensible few hours' notice, but insisted that Israel refrain from preemptive strikes and be certain not to fire the first shot. 
U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger went incommunicado at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York the day of the attack and waited another three days before convening the U.N. Security Council. He wanted the Israelis to be bloodied up a bit. Most of Israel's armed forces were off-duty, celebrating Judaism's highest holy day. The initial success of the attackers when Israel was trying to mobilize its military and reservists so electrified the Arab world that nine other Arab states hurried to get in on the slaughter. Instead of rushing military supplies to Israel, the United States excused itself by saying that it had to be careful not to upset the Arabs and cause an oil crisis and that no American airline was willing to fly even the spare parts Israel was pleading for into the war zone. Oil negotiations were underway in Vienna that very time. Any country that helped Israel in the war faced an oil embargo. Quote, the Soviet Union blocked any U.N. attempt at a ceasefire and refortified the Arab forces with armaments and supplies from the air and the sea. Israel suffered about 3,000 dead, a huge percentage of her population, which would be comparable to 150,000 dead for the United States. Except for a series of what could only be called miracles from God, Israel would not have survived. History professor David A. Rouse writes, Jordan's King Hussein sent two of his best armored brigades to Syria. Saudi Arabia and Kuwait financially underwrote the huge cost while sending thousands of troops to fight the Israelis. Kuwait lent her British-made lightning jets to Egypt. Libya's Muammar Gaddafi turned over 40 French-made Mirage III fighters and 100 tanks. Iraqi MiG fighter jets as well as tank and infantry divisions fought on the Golan Heights, while a squadron of Iraqi hunter jets was utilized by Egypt. Arabs predicted the extermination of the Jewish state and the liberation of Palestine. It was the closest Israel ever came to being defeated. But when the war ended, the Israeli tank columns were on the outskirts of Damascus and Cairo and could have taken those cities had they not been called back for political reasons. A Stern Warning to All Nations God goes on to say through His prophet, quote, All that burden themselves with it, that is, Jerusalem, Israel, shall be cut in pieces, though all the people on the earth be gathered together against it. End of quote. Obviously, Israel, no matter how efficient her armed forces may be, cannot defeat all the nations of the world. God does not waste words. A world united in a huge military attack upon Israel is not an idle speculation. Clearly, God is declaring that all nations will come against Jerusalem and that He will defend Israel and destroy them. This solemn declaration is made a number of times in the Bible. But why would God bring all nations against Jerusalem and Israel in order to put an end to them? God gives two very clear reasons. Quote, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with, that is, punish them for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. End of quote. This is a grim prophecy, precise in its language, and once again, it applies only to our day. For 2,500 years, all nations have played their role in persecuting and thereby scattering the Jews around the world. Only within the last 80 years, however, has the land been divided. Israel has been conquered by many nations in the past, from the Babylonians to the Romans to the Turks. Always the conquering power occupied the entire land. Never did they divide the land. That has only recently occurred for the first time in world history. And all nations have united to do so. The 1917 Balfour Declaration, 1919 Paris Peace Conference, and 1922 Declaration of Principles of the League of Nations recognized that the ancient land of Israel, which had come to be known as Palestine, belonged to the Jewish people. 
It was set apart for them, and Great Britain was given the mandate to see that Palestine once again became the national homeland of the Jews, who had been scattered worldwide. Instead, to curry Arab favor because of their oil, Britain divided it, giving more than 70% to its protege, Emir Abdullah Hussein, when he was forced to leave the ancestral Hashemite domain in Arabia. That gift created the Hashemite kingdom of Transjordan, now known as Jordan. The Muslims immediately demolished every Jewish house of worship and expelled all Jews. This was months before the state of Israel was born. One can count the demise of the British Empire upon which the sun never sank from the time it betrayed the Jews, as God had warned, I will curse him that curseth thee. In U.N. Resolution 181, November 29, 1947, the nations joined to further divide the land. Israel received only 13% of what had been designated for the national Jewish homeland. Jews were pleased to get anything. The Arabs, however, wanted it all. They rioted and attacked Jewish settlements in a reign of terror. Every so-called peace proposal that the Western powers have since attempted to force upon Israel has been based upon the demand that she relinquish yet more land to the Palestinians. Always the cry is, just give them a little more. So it is with President Bush's roadmap to peace, a further dividing of the land. But God has said, the land shall not be sold or traded forever, for the land is mine. God's patience is almost exhausted. His righteous anger is directed against the nations of today's world for dividing His land, and against Israel for ever agreeing to do so. That Israel was pressured by the world is not an acceptable excuse to the God of Israel for disobeying Him, and He is going to punish everyone involved. President Bush, who claims to be a Christian and says that he studies his Bible daily, ought to tremble. So should the other parties to the road map. They are defying the God of Israel and planning to do what he says will bring his severest judgment. A destruction from the Almighty. We will deal with that awesome reality in the last chapter. It is astonishing how many Christians and Jews who claim to believe the Bible remain blind to these prophecies, which are clearly hastening to their fulfillment at the present time. This is Islam. There is not an Arab Muslim map in the entire world that shows Israel. The logos of the PLO and similar terrorist groups display Palestine without Israel. For Muslims and Palestinians, Israel does not exist, and they are determined to make that a reality. Israel is also missing from the map of the Middle East on the wall of the apartment of the Christian Peacemaker Team, apparently without their ever having noticed this damning fact, who are living in Hebron in solidarity with the Palestinians against colonialist Israel. Until Islam's real intentions are faced and somehow dealt with, any peace plans for the Middle East are a fool's dream. Although there are Arabs living in all of the Middle Eastern countries, and they are collectively referred to as the Arab world, these neighboring nations that seek Israel's destruction are not primarily of Arab descent. The Lebanese, Syrians, and Iranians are not Arabs, nor are the Iraqis, Egyptians, Libyans, Moroccans, Tunisians, Algerians at all. Only the Saudis are Arabs. Islam is an Arab religion that originated in the Arabian Peninsula. It was the past conquest by Islam's legions of jihad warriors that converted Israel's neighbors under threat of death. Submit to Allah or die. And it is the religion of Islam to which they were forcefully converted and are now fanatically devoted that unites these otherwise diverse peoples in the passion to annihilate Israel. Israel's neighbors were not united ethnically, politically, or religiously when Zechariah's remarkable prophecy, it must have seemed impossible in his day, was given 2,500 years ago. Even the popular T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, had found it impossible to unite Arabs in a sense of nationalism. 
The only unity came by invoking the deeply rooted religious prejudice of the masses against the Palestinian Jews. On their part, the British blamed the Jews for provoking the Arabs to hatred and murder by their very presence. Were it not for their common hatred of Israel today, these nations would fight one another. One cannot understand the present situation in the Middle East without acknowledging it is the devotion of Israel's neighbors to the religion of Islam that unites them against her, a fact that Western peacemakers refuse to acknowledge, thus dooming their efforts from the beginning. This religious unity is not the ancient heritage of these nations. In their early histories, they all worshipped different gods and fought one another. It was the Muslim conquest beginning in the 7th century that united these nations by force under Allah and Islam. This was the fastest spreading and largest empire ever seen, and the greatest example of the imperialism of which these Muslim nations accuse Israel. Arab leaders have declared repeatedly for more than 50 years, The struggle with the Zionist enemy is not a struggle about Israel's borders, but about Israel's existence. Such statements do not come from a few fanatics, but from every true Muslim who knows and practices his religion. This is Islam. Yet these basic facts are avoided by the West in its attempt to establish peace in the Middle East. Enter Islam The enemies surrounding Israel today have one thing that unites them. They are all Muslims. A basic tenet of Islam is that Israel and all Jews must be destroyed. That qualifies them for special wrath from the Almighty. Yet this prophecy was recorded in Scripture more than 1,000 years before Islam was founded. Muhammad said, as recorded in the Sahih al-Bukhari Hadith, the last day will not come until the Muslims confront the Jews and the Muslims destroy them. In that day, Allah will give a voice to the rocks and the trees, and they will cry out, O Muslim, O Abdullah, there is a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. That every Jew on earth must be killed is not an obscure teaching, but part of the very foundation of Islam, taught to Muslims down through the centuries from their earliest years. It is taught in every Muslim school and all over the world, and in the United States as well. Why must Israel be destroyed? Why not just leave her where she is and isolate the despised Jews from the rest of the world to be confined there? Why not simply reduce her to poverty by economic boycott? That would not be enough. It would leave the Jews in possession of part of the land that the Arabs claim Allah has promised to them as their sole right. The very existence of Israel stands as a rebuke to the declarations of the Prophet Muhammad, the Quran, and Islamic tradition which all declare that the land of Palestine belongs solely to the Arabs and that they will triumph over the Jews. The Jewish state of Israel must be crushed. Otherwise, Islam has been proved a false religion. So long as Islam exists in spite of volumes of rhetoric and mountains of peace negotiations, the Middle East conflict can be resolved in no other way than by the annihilation of Israel. To imagine otherwise, or that the Arabs have any other intention, is to be hopelessly deceived. At a conference of the Islamic Committee for Palestine in Chicago, Illinois, December 28th through the 31st, 1990, Sheikh Abdul Aziz Alday, one of the leaders in the Islamic Jihad movement, declared, quote, Now Allah is bringing the Jews back to Palestine in large groups from all over the world to their big graveyard, where the promise will be realized upon them, and what was destined will be carried out. End of quote. Of course, he was not referring to the many biblical prophecies that God would, in the last days, restore the scattered Jews back into their own land, to which the Messiah would return to reign over them and the world from the throne of his father David. He was obviously referring to Muhammad's prophecy in direct opposition to the Bible that the Muslims would kill all Jews at the last day. 
This was also the prophecy to which Sheikh Yusuf al Qadari referred when in 1989 in Kansas City, he told a group of Muslim men whom he was recruiting for holy war, quote, On the hour of judgment, Muslims will fight the Jews and kill them, end of quote. Clearly, the battle is not so much between Arab and Jew as it is between Allah, the God of Islam, and the Koran, who hates and has sworn to destroy the Jews, and Yahweh, the God of the Bible, who loves the Jews and has sworn to protect them. There is no question that Allah and Yahweh are not the same. The consequences for those who follow the wrong God will be severe. This is the issue that political, military, and religious leaders are not willing to face. They are defying the God of the Bible and will be punished. We cannot pick and choose to believe some parts of the Bible and reject others. But this irrational defiance of God is popularly adopted today. Jerusalem, another sign in our day. The possession of a large part of the world's major oil deposits allows Muslim nations to hold a club over the West for Islam and Allah. Aware of that fact, the European Union continues to remind Israel that it does not recognize Israel's sovereignty over Jerusalem. The Vatican, for its own reasons, numerous official documents declared that the Church has replaced Israel as the people of God, has opposed Israel consistently, refusing even to recognize its existence until 1994, 46 years after its declaration of independence. The PLO is in control of Temple Mount, the very heart and soul of Jerusalem. The nations of the world refuse to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. The United Nations has consistently taken the side of the Arabs against Israel, making the allocation of land to Israel by the U.N. in 1947 something the U.N. would not do today, all the more miraculous in fulfillment of Bible prophecy. The U.N. is adamantly opposed to Israel and everything she does, and is thus defiant of the God of Israel and His pledge to restore His people fully to the land He gave them, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. From 1967 through 1989, out of 865 resolutions in the Security Council and General Assembly of the U.N., 526 were against Israel. The last anti-Arab vote was 58 years ago in 1947. Not once has the U.N. reprimanded those who have, without provocation, beginning in 1948, waged five wars against Israel with the openly declared intention of annihilating her. Nor have the terrorists ever been condemned by the U.N., in November 2003, Israel introduced its first request for a resolution since 1976, asking for a prohibition against Arab terrorists who deliberately target Israeli women and children. Its request was rejected, and the U.N. instead adopted a resolution demanding protection of Palestinian children from Israel. On March 25, 2004, the United States blocked a proposed U.N. Security Council condemnation of Israel's targeted killing of Hamas founder and leader Sheikh Ahmad Yassin. Because the council refused to include a condemnation of Hamas terrorist attacks on Israeli civilians. The next month, an Israeli missile also killed Yassin's successor, Abdul Aziz Rantisi one of the four leaders who founded Hamas in 1987 at the First Intifada. No wonder Israel's neighbors tremble considering the technology, precision, and flawless execution required to identify immediately the occupants of a car and destroy it within minutes with a missile. Hamas has not identified Rontisi's successor for obvious reasons. It is rumored, however, that Khaled Mashal, who leads Hamas from Damascus, secretly appointed Mahmoud Azahar to head Hamas in the Gaza Strip. 
Predictably, there was worldwide condemnation for the just execution of Yasin and Rontisi, two mass murderers and terrorist leaders. But no condemnation for the hundreds of suicide bombers Hamas has trained, equipped, and sent into Israel to deliberately kill innocent civilians. Indeed, suicide bombers, President Bush calls them homicide bombers, that is, murderers, are the most honored people in PLO territory. The PLO-controlled newspaper has wedding announcements and invitations to join in celebration with families who are rejoicing over the marriage of terrorist sons to the dark-eyed virgins in paradise through their martyrdom by suicide in Israel, killing innocent women and children in the process. America and Europe are also targets. The very morning of September 11, 2001, in a time zone six hours to the east, an editorial in Arafat's controlled newspaper, Al Hayat Al Jadida, stated, quote, The suicide bombers of today are noble successors of the Lebanese suicide bombers who taught the U.S. Marines a tough lesson in Lebanon. 243 were killed when a barracks was destroyed. These suicide bombers are the salt of the earth, the engines of history, the most honorable people among us, end quote. A few hours later, down came the Twin Towers to the glory of Islam and Allah, and thousands danced in the streets in ecstatic approval throughout the Muslim world. Since then, a bewildered America has asked a thousand times, why were the Twin Towers brought down, and why are American interests round the world being attacked by Muslim terrorists? Why do they hate us, after all the good we try to do? It can't be because we invaded Afghanistan and Iraq, the 9-11 attacks came first. It is shocking but true that the real question is, why have there not been many more similar attacks throughout America? As we will see, the terrorists are not extremists. We'll have to get over that delusion to successfully fight terrorism. They are real Muslims, earnestly following the example and teaching of Muhammad, the Quran, and the Hadith. They hate us not only for supporting Israel. Without Israel to focus energies upon, there would be even more terrorism worldwide but for our economic, political, and military success, and for the freedoms we advocate and practice, which Islam cannot tolerate. Madrid and London have learned that Al-Qaeda can attack anywhere and at any time. Why has there not been a major attack in America since 9-11? Early in July 2005, counterterrorism expert Juval Aviv said, I predict, based primarily on information that is floating in Europe and the Middle East, that an event is imminent here in the United States. WorldNet Daily editor Joseph Farah has been reporting for some time that al-Qaeda has nukes inside the United States. Paul Williams, a former FBI consultant, says there is no question that al-Qaeda has already smuggled dozens of fully assembled nuclear weapons into the United States. He claims that, according to captured al-Qaeda leaders and documents, the plan is called the American Hiroshima and involves a multiple detonation of nuclear weapons already smuggled into the U.S. over the Mexican border. An unnamed Homeland Security insider claims that intelligence within the U.S. says that a nuclear attack, or more likely many of them at the same time across America, is imminent. There are literally many thousands, if not millions, of young Muslims, men and women, who are both ready and eager to gain instant entrance to Islam's paradise by dying as suicide bombers against the United States, not only in Iraq, but in America itself. It is not alarmism to state that we could be seeing suicide bombers in our shopping malls, on buses, and on trains. The question is only why this has not already happened. Our borders, especially with Mexico, are easily penetrated. The situation worldwide is far more serious than the average person who relies upon the news media for information can even imagine. This book explains what Bible prophecy says about the current danger.
where it will ultimately lead, and what we should do about it. Jerusalem Trodden Down by the Gentiles We are witnessing in our day the continuing fulfillment of Christ's remarkable prophecy. Quote, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. End quote. Jerusalem has been fought over and occupied by nearly every major power in history. Today, though Israel is militarily in control of Jerusalem, non-Jews continue to reject her legitimacy and to dictate practical policy with regard to Jerusalem. According to Christ, this will continue to be the case until Armageddon. Only then will the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. When Israel took East Jerusalem in 1967 and her soldiers wept at the Western Wall, it seemed that Jerusalem had at last been liberated from Gentile domination. However, Acting on his own, without official approval, General Moshe Dayan, apparently hoping to prove to the Arab nations Israel's peaceful intentions, turned over Temple Mount, the holiest site in Israel, to the King of Jordan. In 1994, Jordan turned it over to the PLO. This openly terrorist organization, through its waqf in charge of Muslim sites on Temple Mount, remains in control. It is in the process of building the largest mosque in the world underground, weakening supporting walls holding up the Temple Mount and blaming Israel for their collapse, and at the same time attempting to eliminate every vestige of any historic Israeli presence there. In this construction, the Waqf has destroyed tons of priceless ancient artifacts. The PLO defiantly claims that there never was a Jewish temple on Temple Mount, and that this location was never a holy site for the Jews, and much of the world believes the lie. In fact, there are numerous centuries-old Arab and Muslim statements acknowledging Jerusalem and Temple Mount as holy to the Jews. In A.D. 1225, Arab geographer Yakut, while noting that Mecca was holy to Muslims, wrote that the city of Jerusalem was holy to Jews and Christians, as it has been for 3,000 years. There are many references in early Arab literature to the fact that the Dome of the Rock was built on the site of the ruins of Solomon's Temple. The very fact that, as far back as we can trace, it has always been known as Temple Mount proves that it was the site of a temple, which could only have been Jewish, not Islamic, because Muslims don't have temples but mosques. The 1978 Palestinian Encyclopedia declared, quote, Ever since the destruction of the temple, the link with Jews and Christians has been severed, end quote. The Palestinian Authority itself has acknowledged that Umar, in fact it wasn't Umar but Abd al-Malik, ordered the building of a mosque, that is the Dome of the Rock, on the site of the ruined temple, a revivification of the old Jewish temple. The mosque was not a usurper of a Jewish holy site, but a legitimate celebration of that site. End quote. Yet Muslims today promote the lie of Jerusalem and Temple Mount belonging to them as a major argument against Israel. And that becomes the basis of the world's attitude toward Israel, because she neglects to set the record straight. Israel considers Jerusalem to be its capital. It became Israel's capital under King David 3,000 years ago. Israel's Knesset is located there. The embassies of other nations, however, with the exception of Costa Rica and El Salvador, are located elsewhere. UN Resolution 181, November 29, 1947, which partitioned Palestine, decreed that the city of Jerusalem shall be established as a corpus separatum under a special international regime and shall be administered by the United Nations. The U.N. Security Council, in U.N. Resolution 478, declared that the 1980 Jerusalem Law, designating Jerusalem as Israel's eternal and indivisible capital, was null and void, and must be rescinded forthwith. 14 to 0 to 1, the U.S. abstaining. The resolution instructed member states to withdraw their diplomatic representation from the city as a punitive measure. 
On March 26, 1999, the EU published its Berlin Declaration, supporting an independent Palestinian state, and the German ambassador to Israel reiterated that the EU considers the Corpus Separatum Declaration of UN Resolution 181 to be international law. The UN, EU, and the Vatican periodically insist that Israel's occupation of Jerusalem is illegal. So the fulfillment of Christ's prophecy continues in our day. The United States-Jerusalem Embassy Act, passed by Congress in 1995, states that, quote, Jerusalem should be recognized as the capital of the state of Israel. And the United States Embassy in Israel should be established in Jerusalem no later than May 31, 1999. Since then, the relocation of the embassy from Tel Aviv has been suspended by the president semi-annually, each time stating that, quote, the administration remains committed to beginning the process of moving our embassy to Jerusalem, end of quote. As a result of the Embassy Act, official U.S. documents and websites refer to Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. On its part, Israel considers itself not to be bound by Resolution 181 because it was rejected by the Arabs in the U.N. and in their coordinated attack upon the new state of Israel. Section 214 of the Foreign Relations Authorization Act 2003 states... The Congress maintains its commitment to relocating the United States Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem and urges the President to immediately begin the process of relocating the United States Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. Still trodden down. President Bush dismisses this section as advisory, stating that it impermissibly interferes with the President's constitutional authority. Bush is technically correct. The U.S. Constitution reserves the conduct of foreign policy to the president. Therefore, acts of Congress that make foreign policy are invalid. But one wonders why, as a professing Christian, President Bush doesn't take a step that would honor the Bible and the God of Israel, especially since Congress urges him to do so. Is Bush fearful of offending Muslims because they control most of the world's oil? Surely he is not intimidated by the denunciations they periodically pronounce against the very thought of America moving its embassy to Jerusalem. One of the latest such threats came from Sheikh Ibrahim Madiris in his Friday sermon broadcast over Palestinian television on January 7, 2005. Quote, Bush dug a grave the day he invaded Afghanistan and prepared the grave for burial the day he invaded Iraq. By Allah, America will be buried the day the American embassy will be moved to Jerusalem. End quote. The Sheikh acknowledges that the battle for Jerusalem pits Allah against the God of the Bible. While visiting Jerusalem in 1998, the Vatican's foreign minister likewise called the Israeli presence in East Jerusalem illegal occupation. In March 1999, Israel was notified again that the European Union does not recognize Israel's sovereignty over Jerusalem. In a papal bull on the year 2000 Jubilee, John Paul II again rejected Israeli sovereignty over Jerusalem. In mid-February 2000, the Vatican signed an agreement with the PLO, calling for international guarantees to preserve the proper identity and sacred character of Jerusalem under international control. Waqf director Adnan Husseini declared, Israel needs to remember that Jerusalem is not an Israeli city, but it is a Palestinian city, and we decide what happens here. Precisely as Christ foretold nearly 2,000 years ago, Jerusalem is still being trodden down by the Gentiles. That fact is nowhere more thoroughly documented than in the book, Jerusalem, the Truth, by David Bar-Elan, executive editor of the Jerusalem Post. The God of Israel will not allow this desecration of His holy city, the city of God, to continue beyond the time Christ appointed. In fact, Jerusalem has been an Israeli city for the 3,000 years since David established it. 
Arabs who call themselves Palestinians dispute that claim. To whom does Jerusalem and all of the land that once was Israel, but is now erroneously called Palestine, really belong? The truth is a matter of history and the testimony of Scripture, which is easily proved.